This is Dr. Tom Rozelle. After 43 years of practice and over a million patient visits, the Rozelle Center for Healing knows what works and knows how you can take control of your health and wellness. My team of doctors practice 21st century integrative medicine. Whether you suffer from chronic pain and fatigue, allergies or headaches, we can help. Take charge of your health before it's too late. Make an appointment today. Call 703-698-7117 or visit online at rosellecare.com. That's rosellecare.com. The information provided on Dr. Tom Rosell Live by Dr. Tom Rosell DC, interview guests, show co-hosts, or substitute hosts is not intended or implied to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. It is for general information purposes only. Information from this broadcast should not replace the appropriate consultation and examination process by a licensed physician. Always consult your own physician prior to changing any current medical directive or prescription. Dr. Tom Rosell Live, right now on 105.9 FM WMAL. Welcome to Dr. Tom Rosell Live. This is Dr. Tom Rosell. Indeed, we're live as we try to be every Sunday, bringing you the most intimate and updated information in your health and wellness program. So this is why we do what we do, right? To try to give you not only controversial information, but stuff that you can use. And guess what we're going to do today? We're going to get back to a little bit of normal not normal relative to the world because that's not the way it is right now, but normal relative to conditions that you may be suffering with and don't know what to do about it, particularly since most of you are afraid you know, to step into a clinic. And we want you to know that the Results Center is very, very supportive of your fears and so forth. If you've been to the clinic, you know that we're pre-screening, that we're taking temperatures, we're uh, making sure that we're socially distanced, our staff all have masks on, and we try to support you in every possible way that we can. So if we can do anything for you, give us a call. But more importantly, today's program is about your low back and your leg aching. And it can be the front of your leg, the back of your leg, the whole leg. And, you know, what do you do about it? It's not medication. Stay away from surgery as best as you possibly can. But who better than the professor, Dr. Harlan Browning? Welcome, Doc. How are you doing today? Good. Good morning. How are you? Oh, you know, I have a little difference. You're still up in Virginia. I'm in in Florida for a couple of days or three. Unfortunately, not for a vacation, but I'll soak up a little sunshine. But hey, listen, this is this is a topic that I think at some point we know that 80 percent of all of us have back pain at one time or another, you know, throughout our years. And sometimes it becomes more chronic than others. But then we have leg pain. And that leg pain is sometimes we can't even lift our legs. Sometimes it's burning. Sometimes it's aching. Sometimes. So a lot of people say, oh, my gosh, what can I do about it instead of medication, instead of going under the knife? And that's what we're going to talk about today. Why don't you walk us through what's, you know, when we're talking about back and leg pain, uh, is there things that we can distinguish just initially from the complaint or does it take much more than doing that? Well, you know, firstly, I think to, to illustrate the, the, the commonality and the significance, low back pain visits to a doctor are only second to the common cold and, and viruses. So it is extremely common for people to go visit any kind of healthcare pra- practitioner. So getting back to your, your question about back pain and, and possibly leg pain, certain things need to take place for us to have pain referred from the low back. Typically, we think of nerve compression. Uh, Maybe uh, we have a bulging disc or we have arthritic changes, but we can certainly have entrapments of of the nerve as it passes out of the spine and through the muscles all the way down to the leg. But typically, if we're getting back pain with referral into the leg, it's, it's usually some sort of nerve compression that's causing it. No, when I was in school back in the day when the dinosaurs rolled the earth, uh, they were talking about distinguishing back and leg pain in three different categories. One, back pain by itself, back pain with leg pain, and then leg pain by itself with no back pain. And the latter was, you know, in those days back, back then, the one that was most significant that often if it was spinal related or in some way due to the exit of the nerve roots from the spine, that that one was the most difficult uh, to ascertain where it was coming from, but but also the most difficult to treat and had the worst prognosis. Is that right or has that changed over time? Yeah, I mean, I would agree, especially with folks maybe over the age of 55 who have, let's say, some degeneration, some arthritis in the hip and maybe some arthritis and disbulging in the back, 
you know, I classically will see these people go getting bounced back and forth between the neurosurgeon who looks at the spine and the orthopedic guy who's going to look at the hip. And one says, no, I don't think it's it's nerve being compressed in the back. So go see your orthopedist. The orthopedist looks at it and says, no, I don't think it's coming from your hip. Go back to your to your your neurosurgeon. Um, the the end stage is we're sometimes flipping a coin on how we treat it. So is it truly from the hip or is it truly from the back or maybe it's coming from both places. So that's where a good diagnosis comes in and that's where you overlap your imaging. We don't want to sell the farm because the x-ray says you have arthritis or you have a bulging disc. You need to confirm if what you're seeing on film or imaging is truly what's causing the problem because a lot of folks over the age of 50 have pretty nasty looking films for the most part. You see this just as much as me. Absolutely. But the interesting thing is we can have a, a, a very arthritic joint and it be very stable and not be causing a lot of problems. So we, we need to make sure that the examination parallels what we see on, on pictures before we do something significant like a, a surgical procedure. Well, you know, surgery, I've heard surgeons uh, even admit that you know once once they cut they it's done there you can't reverse the cut so you want to try to do everything that you possibly can before you get to that place uh with with the spinal problem with a, a low back or a hip problem or it may come from the sacroiliac and so forth i think one of the things that we really need to let our audience know is that they hear the worm the the worm the the word sciatica or you know neuro neuralgia or neuropathy and so forth, uh, they have similarities, but they're distinct in their origin. You know, a sciatica is a nerve. It's the sciatic nerve that comes exits uh, from your buttocks and goes down the leg, mostly the back and the side and into the foot. But uh, the the sciatic nerve is really a bundle of five nerves. So now you've got to distinguish which one is, is the problem and where is it coming from. So when you have a patient comes in and says, Doc, my, my low back hip and my leg are on fire, they're burning, they hurt, difficult for me to step up. How do you walk through that matrix to say, listen, this is a problem that's coming from here. These are the levels and this is what we should do about it. Yeah, so you're correct in, in what you said that, you know, sciatica is more a descriptive term to, to mean that we're getting some sort of abnormal sensation in the leg pain, numbness, tingling, um, you know, even weakness. Now, be, because like you mentioned, the sciatic nerve is a confluence of several nerves as they exit the spine, you, you need to start from there and trace your way down. One of the, the differentials that we often talk about in, in our profession, and certainly I'm sure they do it in neurology too, is does the pain in the leg go beyond the knee? So that can be a, a really good indicator if it's truly the nerve getting compressed maybe in the butt, like you said, or is it getting compressed in the back? Typically, if it's not going below the, the knee, then we're, we're starting to think that we're getting maybe something called piriformis syndrome. That's a compression underneath of a, of a, of a muscle, as opposed to if we're getting, let's say, pain all the way to the foot. Now we're starting to think that maybe that sciatica, quote unquote sciatica, is coming from the low back itself. So if you have a piriformis syndrome, and for our audience, what that is, that's a muscle that is kind of a long triangular shaped muscle that comes from kind of midway your sacrum, that wedge shaped bone that you have in between your two hips and your back, and then it attaches to the upper portion of your leg. And then the sciatic bundle that we're talking about, this group of five nerves sometimes goes above it, below it, and Unfortunately, sometimes abnormally it'll go through it. So how do you distinguish? Is that the case? And what's causing, is it a, is it a misfiring of the, the piriformis? Is it uh, a tonic pattern? Is it something that just, it's re related to something else? That, you know, how, do you, how do you walk through that, that area? It typically, if it's coming from the piriformis or you know, it's other muscles in the hip, then you can, you can almost always reproduce it by putting traction or pressure on the hip itself, where if it's coming from the back, there's other orthopedic tests that are mainly suggestive. You know, we, in our office, we kind of chuckle about orthopedic tests because they're, I mean, they're only as reliable as the, the person that's doing it. So in my opinion, it's more, more or less a way for us to communicate with insurance companies on why we diagnose something. If we have a certain orthopedic test, it, it, it lays to, certain di diagnostic um, codes. Having said that, I think 
the most important thing is a very thorough evaluation by the doctor. You, you, you need to actually touch the patient. You need to check their range of motion. You need to sit and talk with them. If the doctor only has five minutes to do all those things, he's probably going to miss a lot of it. Touch the patient. Oh, my God, that's sacrilege. I mean, that doesn't happen too much anymore. No, yeah. I mean, unfortunately, I think a good physical exam is a lost art. And if you sit, and certainly you've been in practice a lot longer than me, if you sit with older clinicians, the way that they go through a diagnostic exam as far as the, the testing is, is, is masterful, to say the least. Yeah, you you see so many patients come in and, you know, you ask them, well, how did they diagnose this? Well, they sent me out for an MRI. They sent me out for a CAT scan. They sent me out for an X-ray. And they said that's where it's coming from because they see a bulging disc or they see some irritation. So here's my question to you. They come in, they really haven't done an examination. You know, they do a palpatory. They just poke or push on an area. Then they send them out for uh, for imaging. How often is the imaging by itself truly accurate and does it lead to procedures that shouldn't be done that could make things worse? You know, I don't know if I could put a, a percentage or a number on it. I, I will say this. If you get, if a person has sciatica, that leg pain, and they have an impairment. Now, that's the important part. When I, you know, when I do my, my presentation on Wednesday, we're going to talk about impairment. There's a big difference between pain, which is the perception the person has an impairment, is something that's measurable. We have weakness or, you know, we have lack, lack of function. So if a person gets an MRI and there's a huge bulging disc or maybe the disc is broken free and it's, you can see it's jammed against the nerve, then, yeah, I think it's a, it's a pretty good way to diagnose it. Now, that's not the majority of cases of people have back pain. They have moderately protruding discs or, you know, you know, moderate arthritis. So it's it's on the fence if that's truly what's causing it. So the, the, the people that have the tremendous ruptures and the tremendous stenosis, those are those are not typical that that I see day in and day out. I agree with you. And, you know, the thing that is that you have to be very careful with as, as far as a clinician is concerned that it may not be the initiating cause of what the patient's presenting with at that moment in time, but it's also prodromal in that that uh, ruptured disc, that uh, uh, bulging disc, that narrowing of the disc space. Ultimately, if it's not treated, in addition to the symptom process, is prognostic of further problems that could be much more severe downstream. Absolutely. So, you know, there, there's a continuum of issues that happen when the, the spine loses motion. And, and first and foremost, joints are designed to move. And when they lose motion, then they typically deteriorate. Similar to if I bought an automobile and I didn't start it, but three times a year, well, one would think, well, the engine doesn't have much mileage on it. Well, that's true. But the fact that we're not using it, it's designed to be used, it's going to cause it to break down just as quickly. So good function usually um, is, is something that I, I look for. And when we lose it, that's when we see the degenerative changes. Uh, the other situation would be trauma. The person has an automobile accident, sport injury, that type of stuff, or micro trauma, that bad posture, you know, those types of things. So we're, we're going to we'll get into that a little deeper. We're coming up to a break and we have some callers coming in. We're here at 888 My guest, Dr. Harlan Browning, the professor. We're talking about your back and your leg. Don't go away. We'll be right back after some important messages. Hi, everybody. Welcome back. Dr. Tom Rosell here. You're listening to Dr. Tom Rosell live. Indeed, we are. And we're kind of a split shift today. Dr. Harlan Browning, my guest, the professor, is up in the uh, metropolitan Washington, D.C. area. And I got out of town. I'm down in Sarasota, Florida, actually attending a conference and checking some things out. So don't get too excited. It's not all that much fun. We're talking about low back, hip, and leg pain, sciatica or neuralgia or neuritis and all those things. And so we're trying to distinguish what you can do about it because we said earlier in the program that over 80% of the population suffers with back pain at one time or the other. It's the leg pain that sometimes is mysterious where it's coming from. But before we get to that, we do have some callers and 888-630-9625. That's how you find us here. And by the way, when if you want to register for Dr. Browning's uh, 
webinar, this all you have to do is call the office at 703-698-7117 and get it registered. We will send you the copy of it to your privacy of your own home, and it should be, as always, extremely informative. But let's go to the phones. Mary Ann, how can I help you? Thank you for calling. Oh, hi. Thank you for being Mary here Ann? today. I have, I have gallbladder pain. I've had it on and off in my life I've been, uh, in the 80s, and uh, I don't know what to do about it at this point. don't know whether I hesitate to go to the hospital uh, because of obvious reasons, COVID, etc., I don't know what to do about it. Uh, I don't want it to be severe. Where's the pa- Marianne? Where's the pain? Where the is the pain? Right hand. Where is the pain? The, ab- the ab. It's the abdomen, the upper right, the- right side, and it is my gallbladder that has been. Uh, uh, I did have a sonogram years ago, and they did not take out my gallbladder at the time. Okay, so that's one thing you don't want to have done. Let Dr. Bonnie and I talk about it a little bit, listen to what we have to say, and if you'd like some more information, just reach out and we'll get back to you and we'll talk to you. Uh, Dr. Harlan, gallbladder pain, you know, it can be so diverse. It can be where she's talking about. It could be in the front, you know, upper right quadrant. It could radiate to the back between the shoulder blades, which is a very common distribution area. Um, so a lady like this that knows she has a problem, what would you suggest in the short term that might be a doable to give her a little bit of relief? Um, well, you know, first of all, I, I would probably um, say it was more abdominal pain until you, you quantify it as the gallbladder that's actually causing it. So having said that, if we want to figure out if the gallbladder is, is causing her pain, um, <clears throat> we would check certainly start by checking some liver enzymes to make sure that, um, that her physiology is good. There's something called ALT, AST, GGT, these are our enzyme markers to see if, if uh, the gallbladder or the liver is irritated or the biliary tree. Um, we might want to rule out that she doesn't already have stones, so another sonogram w- would be indicated. Uh, and in, in certain cases, maybe it's in, the gallbladder is just not emptying, so there's diagnostic tests for that. But the reason I said I we should call it probably abdominal pain is it it could be coming from something else. It could be a stomach problem. It could be a pancreas problem. It could be a diaphragm problem. So, you you know, you want to work those back into the diagnosis again. Yeah, you have a common bile duct that hooks up with uh, the pancreas and and the gallbladder and it dumps together. And often if those areas are inflamed, you can see a backup in one or the other areas. Generally, the gallbladder is very susceptible to allergens, particularly grains. And if somebody has a gluten sensitivity or if they have a grain sensitivity, just by stopping that and cleaning up the diet often will give some relief. But in the short term, uh, what I would do is one, have it checked if we can help you give us a call and make an appointment with Dr. Browning. He's excellent at this. The gallbladder can be gently milked, if you will, and drained over a period of time. But again, it has to do with a couple approaches. Uh, you have to look at it multidimensionally. What are you eating that you're sensitive to? What, uh, you know, when does it react? When is the worst? Generally, there's going to be nighttime after your dinner uh, meal is going to be the worst time of the day for a gallbladder uh, patient. But a lot can be done. And But you want to digestive enzymes. You want to eliminate the grains. You want to uh, it, Give yourself cooked vegetables because if the pancreas is involved at all, the pancreas has to digest the outer coat of the vegetables. And if it doesn't have enough enzymes, it's going to be difficult doing that. And you'll have other kinds of pains as well. You know what I would also add to that? Um, it, it, does the person have nausea associated with this? Because that's a classic sign that it is is the, the gallbladder. Do we get a metallic taste in the mouth? That, that also indicates gallbladder. And certainly the big one would be is if we develop acolic stools, that means our stool color goes from being normal brown to real light, maybe even green. So um, that might be a sign that the gallbladder is, is not functioning. Maybe we're passing stones. One of the common uh, things that I see that really re- isn't talked much in, in the medical community is about just gallbladder sludge. So the bile, which is the fluid that should emulsify fast, just becomes thicker. So it doesn't pass through. So you might want to take some things to to thin it out. We could do the whole show just on this topic, but we've got to take a break. We're coming up to the bottom of the the program. You're listening to Dr. Tom Rizzo Live. My guest, Dr. Harlan Browning. Don't go away. We'll be right back.
Dr. Tom Rosell Live continues now on 105.9 FM WMAL. Welcome back, everybody. Dr. Tom Rosell here. You're listening to Dr. Tom Rosell Live. Indeed, we are. And a topic that sometimes doesn't get as much attention as it needs to. And we're talking about low back, hip, and leg pain of all different types. And who better than Dr. Harlan Browning, the professor who is here and shed some light on the differentiations. If you want to talk to us straight up on this or anything else, 888-630-9625. That's 888-630-9625. Love to talk to you with you. Uh, we're in a crazy world with all kinds of things that are happening right now. And, you know, I want to take a, a second, Dr. Harlan, because we've had so many calls that are coming in on vaccines and these things that are out there right now. And I just want to answer a, a question that's been asked multiple times this last week in the office is, you know, what's our position on any of these vaccines? And simply this, you know, right now it's not mandatory across the board that anybody has to have these things. And we're taking a wait and see attitude. You know, our immune systems are very strong because we treat ourselves the way we tell everybody else to take care of themselves. And we want to see what the side effects we have. There's an article that was uh, just released this weekend that we were talking about uh, before the show that uh, Norway is, is reporting with the Pfizer vaccine that one uh, just under one in a thousand people that are receiving the vaccine are dying from the vaccine. And, the, you know, the side effects are significant. So we're going to see. This is a short term. This is the first time a vaccine's ever been put out without doing long term trials. So the, the short answer is uh, for me anyway, until it's mandatory, uh, I'm going to wait and see and, you know, just back off and see what other uh, takes place. I think there's going to be a lot of shifts in the mechanism. Also, remind, want to remind you that if you walk into our office, we have most of us have air tamers on, and uh, an air tamer puts out a very dense concentration of negative ions, killing 99% of all viral patterns and bacterium and so forth. If you want to check it out, go to our website. Go to Roselle Care dot com and scroll down you'll find it there and also remember that if you're concerned about uh this this viral pattern that we have fda authorized uh, testing uh for the igg igm antibodies but also want to remind you that a lot of the igg igm testing doesn't show either negative or positive for at least uh five days ten days uh after exposure it takes a while for the, the antibody to develop in some cases a little longer than that Having said that, let's get back and talk about this, oh, my aching back and leg. Uh, Dr. Harlan, with with leg pain, you know, we hear a lot of advertising about uh, diabetic neuropathies. And how do you distinguish between what we're talking about uh, as uh, in a diabetic neuropathic pain? My leg aches, it hurts, I got numbness. All of that can be spinal related, uh, but it also can be a diabetic related situation. How do we determine? You know, that's a really good question. You know, you know, most of the time when people have a neuropathy that's um, metabolic, like diabetes, then the, the neuropathy is going to be relatively stable. It's not going to get extremely worse or extremely better. Um, so that gives you an indication. And I think the big one is it's not really provocative. You know, outside of the person standing on their feet, we can't do a test to really make that type of neuropathy worse, where if a person has a disc herniation causing their numbness or something other mechanical, we can we can do procedures that can either alleviate it or make it make it worse. You know, and the thing with neuropathic pain, you know, we hear all the advertising, you know, you come to find out whether or not you're a candidate uh, and so forth and so on. The, the 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 at the end of the day you have to look at the blood sugars you have to look at the inflammatory levels within the body and you have to address those in many cases if you catch them correctly uh, you can reverse a lot of that and in our practice we look at those patients and we do acupuncture we do low energy light laser we do nutritional protocols we stimulate the the neural pathways but anyway that is, is as you said it through orthopedic testing generally that type of pain cannot be made worse. It's it's constant. It's there, and you, know, you may see some changes. Depends on how progressive it is, 
uh, where if the patient uh, has on their own changed their dietary patterns, it might blunt, might, but with uh, uh, diabetic pain, it's, or neuropathic pain, it can be permanent if it's not acted upon. But unfortunately, with diabetic situations, we could have all kinds of other problems. Let's get back to our topic. Now, we're, uh, so somebody comes in, we talked a little bit about, you know, how do you distinguish between, is it a piriformis syndrome? Is it a facet pattern? Uh, is it a discogenic pattern? How do you know which one is which relative to you have a good clinical outcome? Yep, I'm going to handle this. We're going to get rid of it for you. No problem. You know, in many cases, there's a lot of overlap between um, a nerve compression in the spine and a nerve compression in, in the extremity itself. So a lot of times I'll just treat as such. I'll, I will treat both problems at the same time, which for, for the, the layman sounds like, well, that's, that's going to be a lot of work. But in many cases, it's not. In, in the office, as many of the listeners know, we, we utilize a procedure called applied kinesiology, which more or less looks at the function of a muscle as an indication of the nervous system, of the vascular system, and all these other systems in the body. So in a roundabout way, when we're treating the spine, we are treating the, the, the extremity and the leg. So we can almost treat the, the problem as if it is a piriformis syndrome and a low back syndrome at the same time. So I know that's not really answering your questions, but but in many cases, there's so much grayness between the two that it's, in my opinion, best to treat them both at the same time because the outcome usually is is pretty darn good. I I really agree with uh, the comment. The, the, the end game is that you have to reestablish normal structural integrity as best you possibly can across the board. You have to look at the biochemical pathways. Is there anything that's going on that's causing such a high inflammatory reaction that you can't get the system to heal? That often goes to diet. That goes to environmental absorptions and things of that nature. That's that's critical in finding that out. And then how do you get the nerves if they are inflamed, if they're abnormally transmitting? Is it, you know, do we have to uh, use proteolytic enzymes to decrease the fire? Do we have to, but in, once you get those pieces in place, as you know, and we've seen over time, is that you can resolve the greatest majority of these and get them back to functioning state without surger surgical intervention. Absolutely. And, and just like you said, even though something might be very mechanical in nature, a bulging disc, for example, we're still going to look at the metabolic and chemical component. You're right. There, there's inflammatory mediators these are, these are chemicals that signal us to have pain that's produced when the disc is irritated or bulging. So it, it's, it's good medicine to, while you're treating the mechanical um, aspect to also treat the inflammatory. Unfortunately, what we classically see in Western medicine is we don't treat the mechanical very well. We just go after the chemical. So that's where the steroids come in, you know, the over-the-counter NSAIDs and all those types of things, which will address the chemical aspect, but it's not going to change the underlying cause. So the, as soon as the person's done with the round of steroids, lo and behold, a couple months later, the problem comes back. When you're, you know, if you take a per, uh, look at a person bio, biomechanically and, you know, they're, they're dragging, they're limping and so forth. If you give them the NSAID, if you give them the steroid, if you give them whatever it is that the doctor's prescribed, it gets rid of the pain pattern or makes it more tolerable, but it doesn't get rid of the mechanical aberration, or does it? No, no it, uh, it in many cases it doesn't. It just buys us time. And you know, w when you look at what's done, I you know I can understand from a chemistry point what, what they're trying to, to get accomplished. But at minimum, if they're going to go that route and do the injection of the medication, they need to refer that patient to somebody who does something to stabilize the structure. So um, that that part is often is not is not done, or the, the, there's a lot of pushback from the doctor as far as well. If you want to do this, or if you want to try that, you can, as opposed to him telling him, "I want you to go see the." your chiropractor or go see this therapist or that therapist. It's almost always just kind of an option. And I don't think there should be options when it comes to mechanical problems. Well, you know, in our profession and in allopathic profession, we take an oath. It's called first do no harm. And so that means try everything short 
of surgical intervention or something that can have a permanent uh, impact on the body where that can't be reversed. And so when you're dealing with with chiropractic care and applied kinesiological care, and, you know, coupled with laser therapies and acupuncture and so forth, you're dealing with something that at worst is going to produce a minimal result. At best, fully resolve the situation and allow the body mechanics to do what they're supposed to and the nervous system to express itself accordingly. And the pain is gone, but the mechanics are better. Yeah, and, and to take it one step further, because a lot of people – obviously in the back of their mind, want to know if they're a surgical case. What I usually tell my patient is, although they're in pain, that's not the best indicator if they need surgery. Really what it comes down to is if they start to show what we refer to as impairment. They have drop foot. They're losing bladder control, bowel control. You know, their, their leg is collapsing when they stand on it. Now, these are the people that we start to, you know, entertain the idea that they need maybe a surgical procedure. Again, very few people show up into our office that are that far gone. Does it happen? Yeah, I'll see one or two a year. And these people are the ones that typically have had the problem for 15 years and they don't do anything about it until one day they decide to go see someone. And then when you do the exam, the person has atrophy, their muscles have shriveled up because the nerve has been compressed. Um, they might be a surgical candidate, but for the overwhelming majority of people, if they don't have these impairments, then you, you need to, to look elsewhere besides surgery coming out of the gate. Yeah, it's, it's critical that people understand. You know, one of the things I ask on initial consultation and examination and the, the practice is with these type of cases is simply this. I'll ask uh, either male or female, doesn't matter. I said, do you ever get any sharp shooting rectal pain, like somebody shoving a knife or a stick in there, and then all of a sudden it relaxes, or vaginally, the same thing, sharp pain, or scrotal pain, and, you know, and I tell them it's not all the time, but you're going to get it, and all of a sudden it gets your attention, and then it begins to relax, because that suggests low back, L5, S1 nerve root going to those areas, and sometimes it's just uh, set aside as, well, it's something else, or it's a colorectal problem, or it's, you know, go see your gynecologist, when in fact it is low back. Yeah, so, you know, musculoskeletal re a referral of pain is, is you know, is fairly common, and, and you know, it, it becomes convenient to blame it on whatever's in the area. So if we're having abdominal pain, it's convenient to blame it on something going on in our digestive tract, when in fact it may be referred to pain from the the, the low back or uh, the sacroiliac joint as well. In the cases that we're talking about with low back, sciatica, leg pain, uh, in your experience, and, you know, what's the outcome generally on a conservative care? You know, if the person doesn't have extensive degenerative changes, then the outcome is usually pretty good. For the person that has very progressed arthritis, you can get them to a place where they're stable. The thing is, you need to educate the person that if they don't do minimal things moving on, the area is going to be destabilized and they're going to be right back where they started. So, um, you know, it's, it's an ongoing process. It's teamwork. Many, you know, many people d don't want to do what it takes at home. You know, they don't want to do the stretches. They don't want to change their posture. They don't want to eat better. Um, and when they're out of pain, it's like out of sight, out of mind. They assume, well, the pain's gone, the problem's gone. And I, and I can assure you, if, if, you're arth if you have tremendous arthritis on film, you're, you're not going to snap your fingers and make it go away in, in three or four months. It's, there's always going to be a background level of, of degeneration that's going to be there. So you have to do things ongoing, ongoingly to keep it happy. Yeah, it's a lifestyle. It's a matter of making a decision that you're going to do whatever it takes to resolve this thing. You didn't get where you are right now without very specific choices. And unfortunately, those choices were not the best ones. Well, I do this, well, we're going to pick that apart a little bit later. We're coming up to a break. You're listening to Dr. Tom Rizal Live. My guest, Dr. Harlan Browning, the professor. He'll do your presentation this Wednesday evening. We'll tell you how to get that. Don't go away. We'll be right back after some very important messages. Washington's Mall, 105.9 FM, WMAL.
Welcome back, everybody. Dr. Tom Rizal here. You're listening to Dr. Tom Rizal live, as you do every Sunday at 11 on the Eastern Seaboard. And make sure you tell your friends about the program, because we're here to try to give you the most up-to-date information that we possibly can. We thank all of you for reaching out in any way that we can to help you, and particularly our military. You always surprise me with the numbers of emails that we get. And thank you for your service. We appreciate that uh, so very much, giving us the, the lifestyle that we enjoy today in this country. Dr. Browning, welcome back. And, you know, we're, we got a couple of uh, minutes. We want to wrap this up. You're going to be doing a presentation uh, online webinar this week, and all of our listeners can get a hold of it. All they have to do is one or two things. Go to rosellecare.com. That's R-O-S-E-L-L-E-C-A-R-E.com, rosellecare.com. And Go down about halfway down. You'll see the program. It says click here. You register. They'll send it to you, and you'll have it. And please share it. And the other is simply call the office. It's 703-698-7117. Remind you to also check out our iStore. Check out, you know, the things that we have there that were that are there to protect you. We have a, an immune package that's available. In the light of everything that's going on, you got to stay strong. We're there to teach you and to help you and to provide for you. Doctor, uh, what's the uh, what's the webinar going to allow people to do once they go in and spend the time and look at it? Um, you know, if if you've ever had the opportunity to to see a, either one of my live presentations or one of my webinars, we're going to dive into a, a lot of the basic concepts in anatomy and biomechanics. If you understand the way the body's designed, it, it's easier to understand why things go wrong. Uh, I, I'm going to cover six typical low back pain and sciatica patterns, so six things that cause it. We're going to look at diagnostic tests that we would want to utilize, things that people are familiar with, some stuff people are not familiar with, and, and then clearly at the end we're going to talk about ways to treat it conservatively. What can we do to prevent the long-term uh, impairments and keep us out of the operating room for, you know, for the issue at hand? You know, it's it's something that everybody really needs to get a grip on because when you're talking about low back pain, leg pain, in, immobility, you know, in the lower extremity, it ties into so many different systems. And if you really understood them, you under, uh, understand how things progress over a period of many years, that you have the ability to stop it. You have the ability to resolve things and really get your, your body, your physiology, your headspace in the direction that it needs to go. And there's no nobody, in my opinion, better than Dr. Harlan. He is, when it comes to, you know, lovingly calling him the professor, he certainly is. He really has uh, the capacity to have an intuitive sight where a lot of people do not. So uh, go online, check it out, you know, 703-698-7117, call in or rosellcare.com and we'll send that to you. You know, we're coming up to the end of the program. If you if you had to say something to kind of wrap this up uh, relative to what you want people to be mostly aware of in today's world, what would you do with that? What would you tell them? Um, the body's designed to move. So if you're sitting around and you're not moving, that's, that's strike one. If you're in pain and, and more importantly in chronic pain, there's something is wrong with you and that's your body's way of telling you to do something about it. So that would be strike two. And, and you know, strike three would be just a lot of people assume that because their friends or family have aches and pains that it's normal. And at this point now, advertising is telling us that it's normal to have headaches and back pain. So that's really strike three for me. You've, you've got to look at all these paradigms that are going on at one time and ask yourself, do I want to be healthier and, and do I want to be happier? You know, there's so much that we all can do for each other and supports knowledge and information. And that's the reason that we do this radio program on a weekly basis, because we want you to have everything you can possibly have to help yourself. We're coming up to the end of the program and we do this only for one reason and continue to do it for that special reason is that we love you all and we want you healthy and well. Dr. Browning, thank you. I'll see you when I get back. Take care, everybody. See you next week. Are you dental phobic? Do you neglect your dental health because of fear and anxiety? A beautiful smile begins with exceptional dental care, and you can trust in the expertise of soft-touch dental care and Dr. Michael Chung. 
Soft Touch Dental Care is unlike any dentist office you'll ever experience. Their warm and welcoming environment is designed to soothe fears and anxiety the moment you arrive, and they're especially pleased to pamper their honored guest patients. Dr. Michael Chung is a professional and leading expert in all areas of comprehensive dentistry, including cosmetic, sedation, neuromuscular, TMJ, and implant dentistry. Offering state-of-the-art technology, Dr. Chung can give you the smile of your dreams. Arrange for a complimentary consultation today with Dr. Michael Chung and experience the expertise that makes Dr. Michael Chung so unique. Call 703-319-6990. That's 703-319-6990. Or visit bestinsmile.com. That's bestinsmile.com. This is Dr. Tom Rosell, author of Ageless Health. Health is a do-it-yourself program. My book, now also available in audio version, is a step-by-step program of how to take control of your health and wellness without drugs or needless surgery. You have the capacity to change your health and level of well-being. Take control of your health today and order Health Is a Do-It-Yourself Program. For more information and to order, please visit agelesshealthbook.com. That's agelesshealthbook.com. Breast cancer is a major health risk to all women. It can silently grow uninterrupted for years. The Thermography Centers of Fairfax reminds all women to conduct monthly and annual breast exams. Consider a thermography scan from the Thermography Centers as an adjunct to your routine breast exams. Digital infrared thermal imaging is safe and non-invasive. For more information and to schedule an appointment, call 703-520-7591 or visit thermographycenters.com. 